And my father it's always said, it's a big deal. Like I have a hard time with all of this. It's time to be fearless. I want you to picture yourself as an ecosystem. The trillions of microorganisms that live in you and on you are as diverse and complex as any rainforest. Like many ecosystems around the world, there's a decent chance that yours has been, to some degree, ravaged by civilization. A lot of the work that I do involves investigating damage that's been done to my patients' gut ecosystems and trying to figure out how I can help. I use interventions like nutrient therapies, diet changes, pharmaceuticals, and herbs to do things like extending my forest metaphor, put out forest fires and feed the soil and prune some things back and replant others. But every week, I get multiple emails and phone calls to my office asking if I can use a particular therapy for my patients and their ecosystems. And in many cases, I have to say no. Despite heartfelt pleading, heart-wrenching stories, tears, and sometimes bribe attempts, I have to say no. Even when I think that this therapy is likely to be beneficial, even profoundly decrease people's suffering, and be safe for them, I have to say no. This is the weirdest, grossest, most natural, and perhaps the most powerful thing I do with my patients. Most clinicians call it fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT, and most people just call it fecal transplant. It's the process of taking stool from a healthy screened donor, mixing it with liquid, filtering it to concentrate the bacterial portion, and administering those bacteria to a sick person, usually via a retention enema. Feces is a st stinky, messy, magical mass of microbes. <laughs> and we don't often think of it as medicine. But in this case, it can be. It's kind of like the dank soil of an old-growth forest, teeming with life. And fecal transplant can be like taking a truckload of soil from an old-growth forest and moving it to a burn site or a clear cut to repopulate. A lot of animals do some version of this. It's called coprophagy, and some animals even need it to live. Uh, the first human recorded use of this is from the fourth century. A Chinese physician named Ge Hung wrote about this. And in modern times, the first recorded usage is from here in the United States, from 1958. A group of physicians wrote about a series of patients who were dying of an infectious colitis. Their diarrhea was so bad, they were on the brink of death. And having exhausted all other options, these doctors did something fearless. They broke one of the deepest human taboos, and they took human stool and blended it and filtered it and gave it to their patients as an enema. And miraculously, their patients were saved from the brink of death. In fact, within 48 hours, all of their symptoms had gone away. The docs in 1958 were almost certainly battling an organism called Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. It's difficult to grow out. It's difficult to battle. It produces toxins that cause damage to people's colons and can even lead to death. In the United States today, half a million people a year are infected with Clostridium difficile. And of that group, a little over 5% die because of it, a little over 26,000. Just putting that in context, uh, about 13,000 people die of AIDS-related illnesses in the United States every year. C. diff is characterized by frequent, profuse, excessively foul-smelling, yellowish diarrhea, and it most often strikes when people's healthy gut ecosystem has already been disturbed by taking a course of antibiotics. Traditional medical therapy is, you guessed it, more antibiotics. Uh, but this actually works. About 65% of the time, people who have received a single course of antibiotics get better from their C. diff and they stay better. But of that group that relapses, uh, the odds are less good of them getting well and staying well with antibiotics. And each time you relapse, your odds decrease. 
using fecal transplant in the best scientific literature and in my practice is able to cure these people over 90% of the time. It's a lot of lives saved. These are the people who call my office and I get to say, yes, I can use this therapy to treat you. Thank you, FDA. You see, the FDA has not approved fecal transplant for any indication. And two years ago, they defined poop as a drug when it's used as a medical intervention. <laughs> but the benefits are so stupendously clear when used for C. diff colitis that they have given clinicians in the United States permission to use it anyway. Before the FDA defined poop as a drug, I was using fecal transplant for people with a variety of indications autoimmune inflammatory bowel diseases, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, refractory, tough to treat, irritable bowel syndrome, multiple sclerosis, and other things. Because interestingly enough, what happens in the gut can have profound impact on what happens in the brain and on inflammatory and immune functions globally. This is the group of people that I have to tell no when they call my office at this time, since the FDA's uh, guidelines two years ago. So why has the FDA called poop a drug? It's because it is so clear that this therapy can prevent and treat disease. And they say, well, if it can prevent and treat disease, it's a drug. I'm a naturopathic doctor, or ND by training. So for me, this is a stretch. The entire foundation of my profession is that we can use things that are not drugs to prevent and treat disease. I can and do prescribe strong antibiotics and powerful immune suppressants for my patients when they need them, but I give probiotics with the antibiotics to try and prevent C. diff and other bad outcomes. I give DHEA when I prescribe prednisone to try and prevent bone loss and depression and insomnia and other things. I use saffron and St. John's wort for my patients with depression, and I use wormwood and vitamin E for my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and the list goes on. All things that are not drugs to prevent and treat disease. Despite the fact that I am a person who takes poop, centrifuges it to remove the 90% that is not bacteria, and then triple encapsulates the bacterial portion and gives it to my patients to take orally. When the FDA tells me that poop is a drug, I have a hard time swallowing that crap. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you the story of my youngest FMT patient. Landon's mom called me from a hospital in Kansas because Landon, at less than two years old, had been diagnosed with an autoimmune condition called ulcerative colitis. His immune system was causing so much inflammation in his gut that it was eating holes or ulcers into it. And he was bleeding from those ulcers so much, he had required three blood transfusions in the previous couple of months. She wanted to know if FMT could help. At that time, there were no reports of using FMT for children in the literature, zero, not one. And I hadn't used FMT for children in my own practice either. So I had to tell her, I, I don't know. We don't have data and I don't have experience about could this be beneficial for Landon. But we, based on my experience with adults with ulcerative colitis, if this were my child, I would absolutely try it as soon as he was medically stable. So shortly after he was discharged, Leslie and Landon flew to Portland to my office. And uh, I remember that office visit. Landon was a bright, fun, sparkly toddler. He needed three diaper changes during that first visit. And there was as much blood as stool in, in all of them. This was a sick kid, having 10 or more diapers like this a day, every day. His mom and I figured out how to do pediatric fecal transplant, and we watched uh, over the course of a week and a half as his stool frequency decreased. His stools became more formed, and he, we saw less and less blood until there were days when he was having two or three formed bloodless bowel movements per day. 
Landon's story is complicated with ups and downs over the years, but uh, I'm happy to say that today he's doing phenomenally. I talked to his mom just a couple of days ago, and it's been over a year since he's had any symptoms or used any drugs to affect ulcerative colitis. It's as good as an outcome as we could have hoped for. Indeed, when I look at the medical literature for safety and efficacy data, I'm astounded. FMT appears to be as beneficial for people with stubborn inflammatory bowel disease as the newest, most expensive and modern IV immune suppressant drugs, but without the increased risk of cancer and other serious adverse events that we see with the drugs. Now, the studies are smaller and they're early, but so far, they look amazingly optimistic. A colleague recently remarked to me that we used to live in a world where exposure to feces made us sick and antibiotics saved our lives. And now we live in a world where antibiotics are making us sick and feces saves our life. I no longer think of my patients as just themselves. I think of them as a garden to be tended or sometimes as an entire galaxy filled with trillions of lives. I think of our decisions as a society and as individuals to give antibiotics to our cattle to fatten them up, to use antimicrobial soaps and our diet changes, like the decisions of the gods of old whose decisions ripple out among trillions of lives across a galaxy. If there's a take-home message here, it's to tend your own garden. Eat diverse fiber foods at most meals. Don't take antibiotics casually. Let the dog lick the kid. <laughs> I think that knowing our own internal garden, knowing the flora and the fauna, the weather and the soil, is knowing ourselves. I think that knowing how to nourish that ecosystem and even how to completely reboot it when necessary may be the most high-yield area of medicine today. And I thought that that was an idea worth spreading. <laughs> Thank you.